suck them into these amazing dialogues. I, I really, I, I feel like even though it's been years, I just have so many memories of seeing Georgina in action um, <laughs> and, and just, you know, the, the whole vibe and environment that you created for students. That's, that's the goal. Like that's what we're trying to do. Um, and I know that, you know, the subject areas that you taught, those certainly were not easy conversations. <laughs> and so to see students, just so excited to be digging into that content with you. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm really excited that you're, that you're doing this with us. So thanks again for joining us. No, thank you so much, Trisha. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm very honored. Yeah, and we'll go ahead and get started. And I'll just remind everyone one last time as we're getting going here. Uh, all the slides and stuff will be shared afterwards. Uh, we'll make sure you have access to those. Uh, everything will be on both the reimaginewaed.com website and the shiftingschools.com website. If you go up at the top to the, or I think it says webinar and podcast link or something like that, uh, you will see every webinar that we're doing. Uh, and this one will be there as well as soon as we ever give us about 24 hours to get everything up and going if you're over in the chat please make sure in the two that you turn that to panelists and attendees so that we can all take part in the conversation and we do have the q a feature here in the webinar ready to go so you should see another button at the bottom of your screen that says q and a that's where we're going to be looking at questions you can also go in there and if somebody else has asked a question and you really like that question you can thumb up it and the more thumbs up questions get are the ones they rise to the top and we'll really make sure those ones get answered first. Right. So I'm so excited to have Georgina joining us all the way from Tokyo because, you know, when you know how to connect to people, it doesn't matter where you live in the world. That's the <laughs> cool thing about this. You can be from anywhere. Um, so thank you for joining us, taking time out of your day. And I'm so looking forward to uh, talking about strategies and tools for digging into difficult conversations with teens. So Georgina, with that, I will. Thank you. you. Thank you so much, everyone. First of all, welcome. Thank you for joining us. I'm really excited that Trisha invited me to do this uh, because I haven't been doing much of like this kind of work in a while. So that's super exciting and I miss it a lot. So I'm very, very honored by this opportunity and I hope that you get to learn or get to start thinking about the importance of this after this talk. So that's, that's really good and that's really my main goal. I'm from Mexico. I have worked in Mexico, Singapore, now I'm in Tokyo, I'm still working with a Mexican company online, and I'm really, uh, I guess, just an educator, if you have to say. I've taught history, uh, the theory of knowledge, global perspectives, psychology, and other subjects when I was living in Mexico as well, mainly social studies. But I guess my passion is just working with teenagers in any context, in any way that's possible. So that's why I think I have developed a really peculiar interest for a topic like this one. What is it to really work with teenagers more than just teach them? Because I think at the end of the day, that's the key aspect of what education should be about and where, where everyone should be on. So that's a little bit about me. I studied psychology, international affairs. I have a master's in education and I'm also really passionate about coaching. So in that sense, I think it's a very quick summary. So let's start. <laughs> and I, I guess, as, as I said, if you have any questions, just please write them down. So the first thing that I want to show to you would be the objectives and, uh, sorry, over here. And it's just mainly so that you get an idea on how we're going to get moving through the presentation. So first of all, I would like to make it very clear that the most important aspect of having a difficult conversation with teenagers is understanding your role and your limitations. We're going to talk about this a little bit later, but these tend to confuse a lot uh, students or teachers or the teenagers when when things are not clear and then we're talking about something that's a little bit uncomfortable. So this is important to, the, to, to, to make sure that it's clear beforehand. And then how to evolve a tough, a tough story conversation into a transformational one. What do we mean by, about this? We all have difficult conversations or we all avoid difficult conversations all the time. And then we have them and then they, they're still odd or weird or uncomfortable. What we want is to make sure that we transform that. It's just not a Oh, that was weird. I don't know why I was talking about that with this person or my teacher or we don't want that. We want a feeling where everyone involved, it's experiencing of, wow, that was good. That was something I needed. It was uncomfortable. It made me feel vulnerable, but that's exactly how I needed it to be. 
And number three, help you prepare to provide a place where learners want to engage with Antabaya's work, which is very important. And I think at the end of the day is what we are looking for as, I don't know, the societies that we are today in a way. So those would be the objectives. And of course, uh, we're gonna hopefully get over some of them. So what I want you to do first of all, Okay, without me saying anything else, if you have paper, pencil, you can write it down or just think about it in your head. Think of a tough conversation you had when you were a teenager. Like try to remember a moment in your life when you were like, something was happening that was important for you and then you had someone that was there to talk with you. When you just to think about it for five seconds, Okay, I'm sure all of you have that memory in mind. Now I want you to think about what are the feelings the memory brings back to you? I don't want you to think about what happened or the outcome. What, what are the feelings? How do you feel right now just by thinking about it? It could be disappointment, it could be anger, it could be fear, it could be uh, pleased with it. Now, I'm asking this question because at the end of the day, that's what we are left with when we have these conversations in our life, is those feelings. And sadly enough, these feelings, we tend to carry them with us and then we replicate whenever we have these difficult conversations in our life. That is why it's so important that we get it right when we talk with teenagers, because those feelings are also gonna like carry them onto their future. Number two, what is that you receive from that conversation that help you? What was good about it? There has to be something. And number three, what do you wish you could have received? What do you want it to be different? Now, this is the one, the last question, is the one that I want you to keep throughout the presentation so that you realize how important it is to be able to transform these conversations into something that we all feel like, I don't wish I could have received anything else. It was just perfect. So whenever we're working with teenagers, we're able to provide these things to them. Is that clear? So I guess that the reason why I'm, I'm wanting to talk about this topic is because we all have to deal with difficult situations in our lives. Nobody escapes that, right? And I guess that at the end of the day, the person that's there to talk to us or the person that we go and, and talk to has a lot of impact in our life and has a lot of impact on how we deal with things later on. For example, I had a swimming coach when I was like 10 years old, maybe younger. And it was, it was I don't know, like now that I just think about it, the feelings come back. It was very refreshing, but at the same time, it was very empowering the way in which he was there for me and the way in which his attitude and the way in which the, the, the way in he, in the way in which he treated me as an adult, even though I was still a teenager, was extremely good and extremely important. So I want you to think about how the time, the words, the understanding that we give our students, that we give the teenagers in our life, are going to let them realize that they're not alone, realize that in times of conflict and chaos, there's someone for them. And that's why in the educational system, it is essential that we start practicing this. I think for so many years, we've been caring with education in a way where content is the key, curriculum is the key, and then we're talking about well-being now, and we're talking about all these other aspects that are important for education, and it's recent. But at the same time, there's something, in my opinion, that's missing, and that's just the avoidance that we have to difficult conversations. We're not talking about these things enough in the classroom. And that's why, in my opinion, we are now facing a lot of the problems that we see today. And the fact that we are having so many issues about so many aspects of the human experience are a consequence of avoiding these conversations with our students, with our teenagers. We're not giving them the space. Once they asked me a long time ago, okay, where is the best place for students or teenagers to talk about sexuality, to talk about, uh, I don't know, global warming, to talk about fear to talk about depression mental issues and i said school of course 
and home definitely but school why but that's not like the school's responsibility these topics are too sensitive you have so many different opinions exactly because you have so many different opinions that's where you need to have them plus it's a safe place it's a safe place where they have a neutral hopefully a neutral set being that's going to be able to provide that atmosphere where they can express themselves and ask those questions all right so what do we mean by difficult? I would like to start with this because sometimes we tend to, it's a broad term and we tend to just like think, okay, difficult. Uh, I don't know, calculus is difficult. <laughs> Am I talking about that? Well, I'm talking about something a bit different here. So they make you or the other person feel uncomfortable, vulnerable. And this is important to recognize. It may make you feel uncomfortable. It's not sometimes all about them. It's also about us and how we are approaching this conversation. Most of the teachers, most of the educators, they don't talk about these things, not because they're worried about the teenagers, not because they're worried about how they're going to react. It's because they're worried about how that makes them feel. I don't want to talk about that. Like, that's not my subject. That's not my area. I don't feel comfortable with it. Exactly. So that's where we need to focus on, and that's where my talk is gonna focus on mainly. Number two, the content of, content of the conversation is disturbing. I might often reveal children at risk. We may find out things that we probably don't wanna find out. We may hear things that we will then have to deal with, but this is exactly the work that it's urgent and that is necessary because these teenagers have no place, some of them, where to express these things. I don't know if you, have seen on Instagram, but this uh, was a bit shocking and I was also grateful for it. But at the same time, I was like, okay, this is, so there's this account that I follow. It's mainly for teenagers. It's a really good account. It's about psychology and they're trying to help teenagers get through a lot of phases of their lives, right? But then now they came out with, uh, it's a good account, it's reliable, I like it. But now they came out with this thing that every Friday they put a question box where it says, okay, all the questions that you want to ask, but you are so afraid of asking, just drop them in here, right? And I'm just like, it, it, it makes me happy that they have the space, but at the same time, I'm like, hey, hey, teachers, where are we? Like, this is what we should be also encouraging and providing for kids, right? Because you have hundreds of questions, like kids just go on for it and they just and I'm like, okay, I don't know who's behind this account answering to all these teenagers. I hope it's, it's good enough. And that's why I go back to, to schools where it's safe. And it's, it's a place where we can, in a way, make sure that they're receiving the support that they should be receiving rather than just a question on a box on a Friday evening, right? And number three, what is said or agree upon will have consequences and hence requires you to consider the ramifications of the conversation. That's why they're also difficult. Not because of the topic, not because of how sensitive they may be, but because they may have consequences if we're not careful enough. Because whatever we say can have an, will have an impact on how they're going to deal with this topic in the future. Okay? So that's really important for me to understand. I guess that the key aspect here is that, for example, in my personal opinion, in my personal experience, sorry, my family has always been very open. We're always talking about everything probably too much. And sometimes this is not ideal, but I, I grew up with that. So I understand that not everyone has this openness. Not everyone is prepared to have these conversations, but that doesn't mean we should not have them. And that doesn't mean we should not prepare ourselves to have them. So that's why I'm inviting you to continue with the presentation so that you can get prepared for it. So this is what I call the layers of the transformational conversation, right? And you would be surprised, but you are in both of the three points, in two of the three points that I have there. Number one, you are the first layer of this conversation and the most important one. Number two is the topic, the audience, which we need to consider, we need to take into consideration. And number three is again you. At the end of the day, you will realize that whatever you do, however you do it, it's going to mark the success of the conversation or not. And that's why we need to be prepared for it. So what do I mean by the first you? I guess here, and sorry, I think I need to move a little bit. Can you see the left side? Yeah, perfect. So the first you, and that's what I was talking at the beginning with the objectives, is your role and your limitations. Sometimes 
we start talking about something in the classroom, a kid asks a question, or maybe a kid comes and approaches you and they want to talk about something specific. And then we start like, and just we give as much as we have to them without really thinking what's happening. This is this could be good, but this could also have some disadvantages. And this is where I want you to stop whenever you're about to have these conversations, to stop yourself and just clarify, first of all, your role. Maybe with yourself, but also you can ask them, what exactly is what you want from me? What exactly are your expectations of this conversation? What do you want to achieve with this conversation? Sometimes humans tend to give way more than what is expected, right? There's the kid that asks a question and then you're like, ah! and then the kids are like, <laughs> like, nobody wanted to talk about that. No one was looking for that answer. And then there you are. So that's why it's very important that we ask them, what exactly is what you're looking for? What are your expectations? What is what you need? Because maybe at the end, you're going to find out that maybe you're not the right person for it, but you can direct them with someone or maybe it is. And then you could then provide exactly what they're looking for. So I wrote here, for example, coach, teacher, mentor, friend. It's important that you clarify what your role is so that you give them. When we realize the final role and responsibility, the whole conversation seems less difficult. Why? Because now we're both on the same page. We're both understanding what is what we are requiring or what is what we want from this conversation, right? We have set boundaries, expectations, outcomes. So just asking is probably the most important aspect of having a conversation. First of all, what is what you want, expect from this conversation? Now, something that I've seen in a lot of conversations that I've had with students is that they come to certain people because they think that it would be easier to talk to certain people than others. They're not looking, and this is very important, teenagers are not necessarily looking for the right answer, or they're not necessarily looking for the expert. They're looking for someone which would be easier to approach because it's uncomfortable, because it's difficult, because it's something that makes them feel vulnerable, as we said before. So easier doesn't mean is the most adequate person or the most adequate moment to have the conversation. A lot of the times I've been approached by students and they're like, oh, well, you just seem so laid back and so relaxed. And then I'm like, yes, thank you so much. <laughs> I guess I appreciate that. But at the end of the day, that doesn't make me the person you should be talking to. And acknowledging that is also very important. We should not just because we have been approached, just feel like, oh yeah, I'm going to have that conversation with you if we don't feel comfortable with it or we don't feel prepared enough for it. So this is another aspect. And that's why the question of what is what you're looking for, what are your expectations of it, will help us decide and will help us determine whether we need to have that conversation with that person or not. After that, if we have passed that layer, okay, then we move on to the second bit, right? Which was topic and audience. But before the topic and the audience, I want to talk about this you that relates to the topic and the audience. And this is where I think the most meaty, the most important part of these conversations takes part. When we really, after we have set the boundaries, after we have set the expectations, the role is very clear. Now we need to think a little bit about the limitations that, were, that I also said in my previous presentation. And those limitations are mainly about you. What do I mean by this? We need to reflect on our own biases and we need to acknowledge them because true enough, we all have issues and we all have certain things that make us really uncomfortable as well. So if someone's going to come to talk to you about race, if someone's going to come to talk to you about sexuality, if someone's going to come to talk to you about abuse and you feel uncomfortable with it, you need and you must, and it's your responsibility to be aware of these things because whatever you say can set a path. And this is the most important work, in my opinion, as someone who's working with teenagers. We need to be aware of these things. We need to acknowledge them. So it's important to identify what is uncomfortable for you to talk about. And I invite you after this presentation to write them down on a piece of paper. Be honest. 
what is uncomfortable for you to talk about? What are the things that you don't want to talk to students about? I remember I was once uh, with my mentor group in the morning and we were talking about abuse, sexual abuse. One of the kids wanted to talk about that. So we started talking about sexual abuse and it got pretty, uh, I would like to say intense to some, at some point because the students started to share also some of their experiences and I was trying to guide them through those feelings and guide them through those uh, experiences that they've been sharing and then another teacher came into the classroom to ask for something and some of the kids were just very emotional about it so they were crying so then the teacher was like oh what are you guys talking about and the students say we're talking about sexual abuse and I can clearly see that the teacher, her face just changed immediately into like, I just want to run. Like, why, why did I ask that question? I just don't want to be here and like the students. And these are the things that we need to acknowledge. If we're not comfortable with it, that's why we need to ask in advance the, 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 the audience, what are their expectations? Because if we're not ready for it, it's better to step back. Number two, what topics make you feel vulnerable? And because there's two different things with uncomfortable and vulnerable. Uncomfortable is like, I just don't like talking about it because in a way I don't feel prepared. I have not talked about this much in my life, but vulnerable is another level of it. Vulnerable makes me feel like I am opening myself as well. And in this sense, we need to be very careful and we need to be very clear about what are the things that make me feel this way. So I avoid them and then prepare myself to have it, but don't jump into the conversation if you feel vulnerable about it. This is very important. Where is your perspective coming from? So for example, if we're talking about abortion and you have your opinion on it, then we need to be very careful about you as a person thinking and paying attention to where is your perspective about this topic coming from. Now, why do I think this is important? We all know that right now we are living in the peak of fake news, right? And our students are struggling with it so much. And there's just so much content out there about so many things. And at the end of the day, what we don't do as teachers, as educators, but also as humans, is to question ourselves about where our opinions are coming from. Now, when we start asking ourselves this, we start identifying, and that's the next question, what has influenced us to believe in that? What has influenced me to have that opinion on abortion? What has influenced me to have that opinion on, I don't know, euthanasia? So in a way, we need to start digging into our own opinions, into our own perspectives, our own biases. So that's what I mean when, when, when I say acknowledge them. Acknowledge them, I ask you to write them down on a piece of paper. That's not enough. After you, acknowledge, after you know them, then you want to go into the second bit, which is what has made me feel this way or has given me that opinion, what has influenced my perspective. Why do I want you to do this? Because at the end of the day, you need to realize that whatever you say in that conversation will then influence that other that, 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 that person, the teenagers, the same way in which you were influenced by probably someone else or something else. So when we realize about these, we pay more attention on the things that we say. Now, it can still be your opinion, but you need to know where that opinion is coming from. Now, that's number one, but number two, I was talking about fake news just now. When we talk about our perspectives, when we talk about what has influenced us, we also need in a way to remember that maybe some of the things that we believe in are also directed, manipulated, influenced by something that might not be the best thing. And what, what do I mean about this? Most of us have taken all our opinions from our parents and our schools, right? And we just take them and accept them as the way they are, the way they were given to us. I think that when we're 16, 17, 18 years old, we must stop, look at all our opinion, our set of beliefs, our values, all the things that we consider important, the things that we don't consider important, and look at them with new eyes. Not the eyes of a kid 
that just took everything that was given to him or her and then really analyze and look at it with a critical mind and say, do I want to continue believing in this? Do I really want to continue paying attention to this uh, aspect of life in the way that I have been doing it so far? Or do I want to do some research and find out a little bit more about that topic? Because this is key. Because at the end of the day, this is what you also want them to replicate. Not just to hear to what you have to say, not just to hear to your opinion or your experience. You want them to then go and critically think what is what you said, what is what was shared in that conversation. This is the uh, is kind of like the essence of fake news and kids just believing and accepting everything that's given to them by the internet, by authority, the school, parents. I once in a class had a student that said, okay, we're talking about healthy food, da, da, da. And then a student is like, yeah, but that's the food my parents have given me. And I believe it's good because my parents love me. So they must be like providing me with healthy food. And it's like, yes, your parents love you and they do what they can with what they have, but now you're in an age that you can stop yourself, look around, check, find out whether that is really the best food for you to keep eating. Just a simple example, but when we take this to everything else in life, to all our beliefs, our values, we need to stop and do that critical reflection. But it starts with you. You as an educator should be the first person having this analysis on, on this evaluation on your own beliefs. Is that clear making sense? Now, we can then move to the topic. So what I've talked to you about, first of all, is the you in the conversation, what makes you feel uncomfortable, vulnerable. Then we have moved on to, okay, I need to critically analyze and evaluate my own beliefs and my own values and my own opinions and things. What makes me believe that? What has influenced me? Why is my perspective the way it is? Do I want to change it? Do I want to carry on? So then we can transmit that to the teenagers, to the audience. Now, number two, the topic. And I was talking a little bit about this at the beginning. Are you truly pre prepared to talk about that topic? If you're not, step back. Direct them to someone else or go prepare yourself. Find all the information that you may want to find out so you can provide the conversation. And here, what I want you to take with today is don't seek for truths, seek for emotions when you're talking with students, when you're talking to teenagers. It's not about the ultimate, this is the, the, the key aspect of like whether you should support abortion or not. It's, it's not about that. It's about how it makes us feel. It's about how it, and it aligns with our values, it aligns with our priorities, it aligns with who we are. And obviously, we then want to critically analyze that. We want to critically analyze those values and those priorities. Perceptions are very important in this, in this, at this point. Why? Because many of the things that we're talking about, we may have an idea, we may have a perception about it, and we're transmitting that onto them. So we also need to be able to evaluate this aspect. And the most important thing here is validation. I don't know how familiarized any of you are about this, but when we validate someone's feelings, when we validate someone's emotions, we are creating a bridge. And then we can continue to have transformational conversations with them. What do I mean by this? I don't know if you have the, if you had those kind of parents but when we're growing up and you're like oh i'm cold no you're not cold come on it's like look at the sun it's fine don't be like that oh i'm hungry you just ate an hour ago how can you be hungry again all those things that we receive from teachers parents friends all those comments that are not validating our emotions our feelings of life and just as simple as food and temperature imagine when it comes to feelings no that's not something to be scared of Oh, no, that's not something you should be worried about. That's just fine. All these comments are building up. And the key, the problem here is that then we start doubting ourselves. It's like, okay, if, if I don't know if I'm hungry or not, then who knows? So we continue as, mom, is it time to eat? Am I hungry now? Am I allowed to be hungry now? If I cannot tell the temperature of my body, how can I tell whether abortion is right or not? 
who, who, where, where do I get these tools? Where do I get this, this kind of like deep belief into something if I doubt myself completely? So the moment that we validate children and teenagers, we're empowering them. We're telling them, yes, you know, and what you believe or what you feel right now is important and it's valid. And then we can work on it and then we can build on it. But that's just the main aspect of growing a tree from. So validation is very, very important. And acknowledging pain, even if it seems an, as an exaggeration. I've had many, well, not many, but there's one student I remember. He was a very shy student. He was never uh, like trying to challenge the class or challenge his own knowledge. He was just very, very, very basic in a way. And he came to talk to me one day. I, I couldn't believe it because I never thought that I had that kind of like relationship with him. And he said, I need to talk to you about something personal. So I asked, okay, what are your expectations? What is exactly what you're looking for? And after he gave me a little bit of that and decided, okay, let's talk. So he wanted to talk about his girlfriend and about how she broke up with him. A very romantic, very gentle in a way kind of problem or issue, but he was deeply, deeply touched by it. He was really suffering. At some point I was even worried about maybe him wanting to, to end his life because of this problem with his girlfriend. And this is where sometimes adults make a huge mistake. It's fine. Come on, you're gonna be okay. This is just one girlfriend. You are 14 years old, 15, you're gonna be fine. You have your life ahead of you. No, 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 no. That's not how he's feeling it. And we need to acknowledge that and we need to respect that. And even if it seems like an exaggeration to us, and even if we know he's gonna be fine, right? At that moment, he doesn't need that. And this is something that we carry on as adults. I was looking at, I was looking, I was listening, um, a friend sharing uh, his story because he lost his mother and then he lost his father like five years later. And then he lost his best friend like five, like he was talking about death. And something that he mentioned that really struck me was the fact that nobody really knew what to say to him ever. He said he was so uncomfortable. You're like, I was going through all these deaths in my life. And people were just, you're gonna be fine, everything is okay, don't worry, we're here for you, we're here to support you. And that clicked me because I was like, that is exactly why this talk is so important. Because at the end of the day, we're creating adults that don't know how to have these conversations with anyone, because we're just too uncomfortable about all this. So going back to the topic, it's important that we understand that whatever it is that they're sharing with us, it is important to them in that sense, and we need to honor that. Rather than trying to take them to a beautiful place. It's like, we feel like, no, you're suffering. Let's just make something to get rid of that suffering. So I'm just gonna take you to a beautiful place. So what, how do I do that? By telling you everything is fine, or everything is gonna be okay. Or there's nothing to worry about. And then I think I've done my job. No, your job is to stay with them in that miserable place, in that painful place and walk with them in a supportive and nurturing way. Is this clear? Now, when we, I, I put the topic and the audience together because they're not separate. They're, 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 very, uh, they're very linked in the sense that a topic that's uncomfortable for certain people may not be for others. And a topic that may be very easily approached with certain people may not be with others. So that's why these two are together. So I want to give you an example of that. For example, I, was, I, had a, I had a group of students. We were working for a school in Kenya called Araja. So we were gathering um, a lot of information about how the students in the, in the school in Kenya were uh, dealing with some of the issues and what were some of the, the problems that they were facing. So then we can come up with some tools and strategies to help them, right? So one of the topics that came out was, uh, female genital mutilation. Now, something that I realized the moment the topic came out and the moment we were going to discuss it, I realized that in the, in the class, I had three students who were from countries where female genital mutilation was a common practice. Here we have a topic that could be very different with different people. 
the fact that there were these three people from that, those countries makes the whole conversation different and makes you be completely aware and prepared for having that conversation in a way that everyone is included and in a way that everyone could be understood from their perspectives, but at the same time that we're critically analyzing and critically evaluating the topic. That's why I wrote here something very important. Number one, treat them as if they were adults. This is another mistake that we make a lot as educators. Teenagers, even though they're teenagers and even though they haven't reached adulthood completely, they still could be treated as adults and they deserve that treatment. Because when we're talking about difficult and uncomfortable situations, they want to be heard as an adult, not as a kid. A boy making reference to rules, no, you're not allowed to do that. For example, here, femi femi sorry, female genital mutilation, it's wrong. That's not okay, we should not do that. Hey, 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 I have to be very careful about this. I have to be very careful about approaching it as a, from a place of authority. When we're having difficult conversations, there's no authority. You have to lose, in a sense, your authority, like your role, right? And make sure that, of course, safety and you're protecting and you're not giving information that's incorrect or information that's misleading or that can cause misunderstandings. But at the same time, you are not setting the rules. You are not setting what is right and what is wrong. You want them to get to that point by themselves. You're just there to guide them for that, to facilitate that space, but not to tell them what's right and what's wrong. Do not order them. Do not say, as I just said, like the rules, yes, do these, no, don't do that. Don't look into that website. Yes, look into that website. What do you think? What makes you feel, what, what, what are the feelings that come out after that? We are there to ask the questions, not just to set what is right and wrong. Uh, as I said, it's not that type of conversation. And as I said before, validation and the opportunity to arrive at their own conclusions and decisions is key. You're asking the question so they can get to the point by themselves, to whatever suits them and aligns with them. Because remember that outside of the classroom, outside of that conversation, there's a world that they still have to face with parents and religion and values and morality. So we cannot just transform them completely or change completely the way in which they think to then throw them into that world. It has to be them and it has to come from them. And I wrote here five points that I think are extremely important for you to remember when we're talking about the audience. A lot of the time, we tend to be very compliant to people. Students do it, we do it, parents do it. So we want to discuss that with them as well. How does that feel? When we talk about this topic, how does that feel? What is what, is what makes you, in a way, believe in this or believe in that? What is the motivation? that you have for believing into these things. Those are the key questions there. Number two, you want to remember, to remind them, sorry, that they are responsible on how they use their freedom. This is very important because we tend to believe, and mainly at that age, that we don't have options, that everything is just tight and it's just like, no, but this is just the way it is. This is the way my life is. There's, there's not like an, a door for them. You have to remember that they are options, their choices, and then that's number three, the capacity we always have of making choices. But when we make choices, it comes with a great responsibility, right? And that is the aspect that we want them also to, to be reminded of, which is then the next one, which is a role of consequences. So first of all, yes, you have a choice. You have to be aware of how responsible you are of your choices, and you have to understand that there might be consequences on some of those choices. This is something that we also need to talk about. When we talk about abortion, when we talk about death, right? When we talk about abuse, we need to also make them think or provide them the space to think about, okay, you decide to believe that abortion is right. Okay, what are the consequences of your choice? What are the consequences of that opinion. Think about them. I'm not going to tell you. It's important for you to think about how you're using your freedom. And I remember I, have, I was teaching this class called Global Perspectives. And this is something we were doing all the time in that class. And we had a unit called Faith, Ethics, and 
politics, I think, or something. I can't remember very well the unit, but in any case. And uh, there was something that we really wanted to think, wanted, wanted them to think about is like, okay, you are a student. Right now you have 15 years old and you believe that. You have an opinion on a certain topic. You think this is right and you think this is wrong. What would be the impact of that? Well, not much means like I'm just a student. There's nothing I can really do. Like it's not like I'm going to, I, I don't run a country. So it really doesn't have an impact. Okay, it doesn't have that level of impact but it sure has an impact. Like it has to have an impact to a certain degree. What is it? Let's find out, let's find out. So digging into it is also important. It's not just talk, talking about abuse. It's not just talking about female genital mutilation. It's talking about the consequences of whatever it is that you end up believing in, whatever it is that you end up taking with you, right? So this is what we also need to focus on when we are talking to, to certain group of people and we want them to really acknowledge that. Uh, there's, I just want to share with you really quickly a story. There's in Mexico, uh, there was this girl, she was 16 years old, 17, I think. She had a boyfriend. They've been together for five years. He said, let's have sex and uh, let's record our, ourselves. They had sex. He recorded her on the video. You cannot see him. You can only see her naked body. And it was one minute long video. They broke up six months later. He shared the video with everyone else and it just unraveled a lot of things. I'm not gonna go into the details of it. At the age of 17, she tried to kill herself many times. She was locked in her house, didn't wanna talk to anyone, didn't wanna tell anyone what was going on. Eventually her family found out. And this is what I want you to take with uh, of this story. When, she when her mother finds out She's so afraid because at the end of the day, that was her worst like, thing that could happen, the mother finding out. The mother said, you haven't done anything wrong. You do something everyone else does. You have sex. Everyone, I have sex, your grandmother has sex, your uncle has sex, your sister has sex, everyone has sex. There's not wrong. There's nothing wrong with it. You trusted someone and that's also fine. That's good. There's nothing wrong with it. You didn't kill an animal, a dog on the street. You didn't uh, hurt someone. You didn't steal something. Those things are bad things. This is not bad. You trusted someone and you had sex. Fine. Stop it. Let's move on. That completely changed the way she was looking at things. That completely changed the way she was leaving this pain and this misery. And that took her to be today the woman who's leading in Mexico a law that puts people in jail if they record someone without their consent, have in their phones or in their computers a video without someone else's consent, and if they share a video without their consent. There is a law now in Mexico with her name that puts them in jail. And you may think, oh, wow, that's amazing. She's amazing. You know what was key? That conversation with the mother. It was key the fact that the mother was able to provide that validation, right? But at the same time, to be able to provide the, the, the atmosphere, the, the net, the net that was going to support her. You didn't do anything wrong. Changing the mindset of what she was experiencing. And this is something we want to allow with our teenagers make them think about it from another perspective make them look at it from another point of view and maybe that thing that they are experiencing as super big which in her case was really big they can also see it with a different light and that's with everything else that we have in our lives so here it's it is it's key to remind ourselves about it now i think that the problem in the world right now, if, if I have to pinpoint it to one thing, right, is that we're not thinking critically. No one is, right? We are just endlessly repeating everything that has been done from the past, right? We're just a continue, uh, continuity of habits and values and beliefs. And there's a couple of people here and there who are challenging all that and are like, come on, let's look at it from this point of view, let's look at it from this point of view. But at the end of the day, we are not critically thinking anything. 
I remember when I was teaching history, I would always tell my students things like this. Okay, you brushed your teeth. Oh yeah, me, of course, I brushed my teeth this morning. Oh, great, why? Oh, because I wanna keep them clean. Okay, do you know when that practice started? No, well, okay, let's look at it. Okay, long time ago, humans, their teeth, they eat food, they need to wash their mouth because then they started to lose their teeth and they don't wanna lose their teeth, so okay, perfect. Do you eat food still? Yes. You have teeth? Yes. Do you want to keep them? Yes. Okay, let's keep washing them. Right? So, yes, we need to go over these about pretty much everything we do in our lives. Because why do we do it? We don't know. And we repeat and repeat and repeat. Now, let me tell you something. Having difficult conversations with teenagers stops this nonsense, stops this repetition of, I believe, abortion is good or I believe abortion is bad because I've been looking at it from the same point of view that my grandparents and my great grandparents have been looking at. Yes, back then there were teeth and food and people wanted to keep their teeth clean. Perfect. Today, still. Back then, uh, the amount of children, the word abortion, no abortion was in a certain way. What is it today? What are the demands of the world we're having today? What is the context today? Do we want to continue carrying with that belief? Yes, perfect. Let's go on. Let's keep with it. Do I want to carry out with that opinion after I have analyzed it? Yes, it's fine. But let's just stop ourselves to critically think about everything. So the other day I saw a, a colleague of mine posted on Instagram, this newspaper in the States said like, oh, the schools should like teach kids how to do balance research like our students don't know how to do balance research and they're always like taking into fake news and the schools are not teaching them and my colleague was really uh, like she was very angry at it she was like of course we do it like come on i do it in my classroom every day she was uh, in a way she felt like they were talking about her and i replied to her and i said yes of course you do it and many other teachers do it but not everybody not all the schools. And this is also important that we acknowledge that even if certain things are happening somewhere, it doesn't mean they're happening everywhere or to the extent that they should be happening. So that's why the invitation to start thinking about having these conversations with your teenagers is going to lead to a world where people can be and definitely I hope would be more critical about everything else and then it could align with all the work that the school is doing, obviously. So what I have in this slide is why teacher, what sorry, why teenagers need to have the skills that enable them to have hard conversations. Okay, we've talked about the importance of you being ready for it, the importance of understanding the topic and the audience. But I want you to, before I show you the third you that I was speaking about at the beginning, what I want you is that also understand at this point that when we provide the students the skills and the trust in having hard conversations, we're creating adults that are not going to feel uncomfortable if someone says the word sexual abuse, right? Because they understand from a young age that it's okay to talk about difficult things. I don't know, think about right now about your family, how things are being dealt in your families when it comes to difficult topics? Do people talk about the, the uncle that's really uncomfortable and is drunk in all the parties? Are people acknowledging that? Do people talk about the rape that happened in the family? Do people talk about the person with a different sexual identity in the family? Do people really approach these topics in your family? These are, in a way, skills that make us, as, an, as adults, when we grow up, better at dealing problems and conflict than if we didn't. So we want teenagers to have these conversations at a young age because they are going to grow up to be adults that are going to be able to deal with problems better in a more honest, in a more open, definitely way that it's going to allow them to solve the issues of their lives in a smarter way, in a more approachable way, rather than hiding, hiding, keeping inside, keeping inside, keeping inside. We need teenagers to develop these skills. 
Now, how do you help students conduct balanced research so they're very informed? And this is something that I took also from that example that I gave you. I think that you can teach them how to research online. You can have lots of lessons on, okay, what's fake news? Or what is, uh, I don't know, someone's finding a website and they just believe completely what the website is doing. How do we teach students to do that? Yeah, yeah, just set up a couple of classes where you show them some examples and then you're like, oh, look, it was fake. And you guys all believed it. Oh, no, let's be more careful about next time. How do we do balance research? No, 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 no. I think, of course, all those exercises and all those lessons help a lot. But at the end of the day, what you want to develop is, as I was saying before, critical thinking habit, questioning everything. And it doesn't come just to news. It doesn't come just to whatever the media is telling us. It comes up, it's about our topics, about the things that are happening in our life, about the things that are important to us. So how do you help them? by having those conversations, by allowing them to have that space where they can and they will discuss these topics and think critically about what has influenced them, as I was saying before, what has influenced my perspective and what is the impact of my perspective. When you do that, they are in a way ready to go out there and do balance research because they will be thinking about it in that way. What has influenced that perspective and what is the impact of this perspective? So when they read something online, they're asking these questions because they had asked them about their own beliefs already. Okay, now let's go to the second you. And I was talking about the, at the beginning is, I, I like to say it as an internal you, your own fears, your own uh, uncomfortable topics, your own vulnerability. Now is the outside of you, is what you tell without saying it. So it's your attitude when you're talking to them. Are you nervous? Are you shaking? Are you like, oh my God. What is the attitude that you have when you're talking about these things? Because they'll sense it, they'll feel it. They'll know something's right or wrong based on how you are moving and how you are talking. Number two, your intention, and please, this is something I guess as teachers, it's a big mistake that we sometimes make. I want them to believe in what I believe. That's, that's very risky and very tricky, but we do it unconsciously. And that's why I want you to be aware of it. What is your intention? Why do you wanna have this conversation with them? Your tools, and I'm gonna provide you some tools in a moment. So that's, we leave it that for, for, this, for the next, for next. The words you choose is extremely important. And here I'm not saying like, oh, nice words. No, no, no. The words that we choose have a lot to do with the way in which we communicate a message to them. <gasps> Haven't you thought about that before? Oh, I'm surprised, kids. Come on. <laughs> Wait a second. Don't put them in a place where your words are attacking, where your words are not inviting, where your words are already discriminating. This is very important. What is the set of words that I choose every day in my life? And I want you to think about this, not only to what you tell the students or the teenagers, but what you tell yourself. Because those words that we choose for others normally are the same words that we choose for ourselves. So also the same things that we tell them, we tend to tell ourselves. So when we do this, when we, make con when we are aware of these, then it's easier for us to have a better set of words to use for others and definitely your body language, right? Like we, we move, we say a lot of things with our body and we need to be aware of it. I just very quickly wanna share with you when I was in sixth grade, uh, I went to a party with all my, I was in a swimming team and we, we had a party, it was a pajama party and it was all, all ages because it was the whole swimming team, right? And some of my friends, grade six, they drank alcohol in that, par in that party, right? In that, pajama party and I was traumatized by it I couldn't believe that they were drinking alcohol I mean of course the, the, the people who were 20 18 it was like fine but we were sixth graders right so the next day I went to my teacher because I really trusted her and I said I was really worried that these friends were drinking alcohol in the party and a conversation that could have been so powerful so good for me so influential in my life ended up as the worst one of the worst experiences i've had she just said to me thank you so much 
He didn't say anything. So didn't, my expectations weren't fulfilled. What I was looking for, I didn't receive. She went, talked to the administration, and they kicked the girls out of the school the next day. Like, seriously? In a way, it's like, you're not supporting me, but you're also not supporting these girls. It was just a way of dealing with it that it's completely avoiding the issue. We don't want to talk about this with you, and we don't want to talk with this, about this with them. We just don't want to talk with anyone about anything. Let's get out of my face. So we need to be aware that by not saying something, by not doing something, you're letting pass a great opportunity for growing and a great opportunity for people to become better adults and making choices. Here are the tools that I want to talk to you about. And I took all these from Cognitive Coaching. Their website is there, thinkingcollaboratively.com. I totally recommend you to go to their website. It's an amazing. I took the, the certification with them and it's just incredible. It's one of the most powerful tools that I've had over the years in my professional career. career. And your tools and questioning strategies are mainly and very simply asking questions. The more questions you ask, the more information you get, more clarification you get of what they need, but at the same time, you help them get to a place where they can come up with their own way of thinking, their own conclusions. So I put pause because it's really important to take that time to really think. Sometimes we tend, I don't know if you've heard the phrase before that says, we answer to ourselves, not to what the other person is telling us. So when we pause, we allow ourselves to really think. Paraphrasing is extremely important because we tell the other person, hey, I understand what you're saying. Or if I don't understand it, can you please correct me? It serves as clarification. So before moving forward, let's make sure I understand this part. Let's make sure that I understand this aspect of what you're sharing with me. Pose questions and pay close attention to their body language to how they're feeling their emotions sometimes i've had students that they're on the verge of crying right and if you don't notice that if you don't pay attention you're losing a great moment of taking care of them right so it's very important that we are paying attention to all the students if it's a big group or if it's a group of more than 10 people we want to pay attention to how everyone is experiencing it because some people may be having a different outcome of it so we want to pay close attention to it so it's just a circle pause paraphrase questions paying close attention pause paraphrase questions and this is Mainly what you need to be doing is not you telling them, as I said, the truth of something or rules or telling them how to do certain things. You're just allowing this conversation to evolve in that way by you asking the question. Now you are like, okay, what kind of questions do I need to ask? Listen, there's no right or wrong as long as you're listening to what they are telling you. You will know what to ask if you listen carefully to what they're telling you but you, will be, you still will be like, okay, yeah, Georgina, thank you so much, but I need more than that. Well, I'm gonna give you these, uh, these five elements that I think you should consider. Always an approachable voice, always trying to get to what they're telling you, not to what you think is right or, or wrong. Always asking in plural forms is very helpful. We don't wanna make it about certain things or specific things. We wanna use tentative language. I don't know if you, uh, are familiarized with this or not, but when we present ideas as ideas, not as definite answers, right? So when we ask a question, we say, for example, we can say, have you considered that before? Or have you, are you aware of this or not? But we don't say things like, why you haven't considered that before? Or why haven't you thought about it? Or look at this aspect. Don't you think this is better than that one? Right? So we're not giving definite answers. We are asking them so they can provide you with more ideas that are their own needs and their own ideas and they align to whatever it is that they're looking for. Positive presuppositions. Here, we are also all the time, as I was saying before, sometimes talking very negatively about or asking questions in a neg with a negative connotation, right? When we say like, well, I was just giving you an example. Haven't you thought about that before? Or 
don't you think this is wrong? Or don't you think that other person has a better opinion on it than you do? Like, come on, no, 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 no. We need to be able to take them to a place where they have a positive alignment with the point of view that they're trying to take to you, that they're trying to discuss with you. Every single topic, no matter how difficult it is, could be seen from a positive perspective as long as we take them to that place, right? So for example, let's think about the student that I was talking to you about that had broken up with his girlfriend and he was very, 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 very sad, right? So something that we could be asking this student is like, how do you think you can get out of this? What would be the different things that you may need to feel better? What would be some, what, what kind of support would you need or what kind of support is what you may need at this moment from me or from other people rather than don't you think that it could be fine just to wait a couple of months and then you will forget about her right and then open-ended so always begin your questions not with a verb so for example what is your thinking about instead of have you thought about what i was just telling you before right so it's what is your thinking about? What are your needs about? What are your fears about? What are your necessities about? And fears, for example, here now, now that I just said it, I think I would like to rectify that because fear could be not a very positive presupposition. We don't want them probably to think about that. We want them to transform it into something that's uh, more positive than the fear aspect. But it depends, again, as a conversation. So these are the big set of tools, the, the big set of things that you need to remind when having the conversations, so just to kind of like summarize everything. The you that realizes that you have fears, that you have uncomfortable topics in your life, that you need to evaluate them and you need to find out where they're coming from and who has influenced you to believe in a certain way before you talk about it. Because sadly enough, we, we may transmit that to the teenagers, even if we don't want to. Number three, we want to be aware of the topic that we're talking about. Are we prepared enough to talk about that or not? The audience, we need to consider who is uh, forming that group of people. What are their different needs? What are the different expectations? And the second you, which is your intention, your body language, your tools, your questionings, everything that you transmit when you are having the conversation that is extremely important. And just to to end with it, always, always, always ask for feedback. Do not leave ever just like, okay, I hope this was good, bye-bye. No, no, no. There has to be a time where you can talk not about the topic, about how the conversation went. They need to unravel also their emotions, their feelings, their impressions on that talk, provide the opportunity to hear from them. That's key at the end of any conversation that we have with teenagers and Yes, having the conversation can be difficult, but avoiding it is unforgivable. And as educators, it's, it's just, I think, part of our role, more than any content that we may teach our kids. And I think that would be it for me. Thank you so much. I don't know for how long have I been talking, maybe like three hours, sorry. <laughs> you were perfect, right on time. I oh, listen wow. to you for another three hours. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I know. absolutely. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, no, it's great. It's so good. And as we're waiting for a few people to, you know, again, drop your, your questions into that q and I'm wondering, and I, I know that you know the, the answer to this, so I would just love to kind of hear you go through at the beginning, you were talking about how important it is that the person in conversation with you feels validated. And I think sometimes that's easier said than done. Um, you know, I, I think sometimes people are like, oh, you know, I listen to them. They should feel validated. I said, uh-huh. Don't they feel validated? <laughs> <That's right. laughs> um, so I'm wondering if you could just kind of yeah. walk us through an example of, or two, or even just kind of like a sentence frame that you, that you would recommend using. So in, in your mind, when you say, okay, validate, what does that actually sound like? Cause I'm guessing it it's sounds, not, uh-huh. <laughs> it sounds as, you know, when, when I had the tools slide and I said the paraphrase, when we paraphrase, that's where we want to then kind of like replicate, mention again, whatever is that they're sharing with us. 
So in that sense, they hear it and they say, oh, this person actually knows what I'm talking about. So for example, let's, let's use my, my student's example that's very sad because he broke up with his girlfriend. It's just simple. So he says, I'm extremely sad. I'm extremely, uh, I'm very depressed. I want to end my life. Let's leave it like that, right? I know that right now you're feeling extremely sad and I understand why you want to end up your life. You acknowledge the pain that he's feeling, that you, you know and you recognize that. Now, it doesn't mean that it says, oh, yeah, you should end up your life. I understand why you, want, you may want to end up your life. I understand your pain. I understand where it's coming from, right? And then I think that the key element there would be to follow up that with what do you think you may need right now to stop feeling that way? Mm. What would be the support that you need at this moment to then stop feeling that way? Because validation is not about telling them right or wrong. It's just about understanding how they feel and, and knowing that it's valid the way they are feeling. It's not about saying, yes, I know you're very, like, for example, the, the opposite of a not very validated, uh, not a very validated, validated, or a way to validate their feelings would be, Yes, I know you're very sad. I know you're feeling terrible today, but that's not a reason for you to feel like dying. That you're not validating their feelings. So validating their feelings is, I understand why you feel that way. I understand this is difficult for you. I understand this is sensitive for you. I know, I, 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 I know. And just by saying it, they're like, oh, okay, that's fine. And then we can start moving forward and then we can start talking about what are the things that we need to do in order to get out of this hole. Is that, was that clear? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah. And again, I, I like that you asked us at the start to just sort of, you know, go back and remember when we were teens and, you know, a hard conversation that maybe didn't necessarily, or I, I don't know if you framed it that way as one that didn't go the way that you wanted it to, but I feel like many of us. I think that's the f fascinating part. She didn't frame it that way, no. but I never... instantly started thinking about those questions and I could like the feelings. I'm mm. just like, Oh, I don't want to remember that. <laughs> I don't want to remember that conversation, exactly. you know, because the feelings like you, you know, like you were saying, the feelings you have with those conversations that you don't realize probably even today, how much that is impacted you know, because especially, you know, when you're a preteen teen, those conversations are, are huge. They are emotional conversations. You know, and, and if you know what, Jeff, if you ask any adult, what do they remember about school? They're not going to remember any lessons. They're not going to remember any content. We don't. We remember those conversations. We remember those feelings. We remember that teacher that was really yeah. good or really bad. Yeah. And and, and this is what we need. We need to start acknowledging this as, as educators because we are creating that pattern also of feeling uncomfortable and we carry on with it. So true. And I, you know, I really appreciate a lot of the personal example that you shared from, you know, even your sixth grade perspective, because it's a really powerful reminder that you know, students really from, yeah, like age 12 onwards are making those decisions that are life altering. Who do I trust? Yeah, Drinking and, and that, driving, drugs, you know, yeah. all of those things are huge. huge well, and I just, yeah. And I think one of the things like I, I put in the chat that you think about is a lot of times, a lot of times, and we know this, but a lot of times teenagers will test you on not a hard question to yes. see how you will respond so that they know that you're open to having the hard conversation. That's true. You know, and if you fail the test, you're never going to get to the hard conversations. Never, and I, never. And I find that's, you know, I mean, and that's, I mean, we all do that. I mean, whenever you're entering into a friendship, you don't know how deep that friendship's going to be. And so you're always just kind of like, you know, picking around the edges until you, you know, and you're testing the waters. You want to see, is this somebody that I can have deeper conversations with exactly. if I want to let into my life? And kids are very much aware of that. Definitely. That's really, really important. And that reminded me of something. When I was uh, working in Mexico, I went with students to France for six months. And 42 kids and two teachers, imagine the mess, right? <laughs> so we yeah, in France for six months. 
And I had a lot of really, I, I developed really good relationships with many of them. They're still my friends right now after, I don't know, 10 years. But when we came back, there was a student and it was really funny because she will, she, she will continue like visiting me in my office, even though I wasn't her teacher or anything, just talking. And then one day she said something about, oh, I read this about uh, homosexuality. <laughs> and she was kind of like laughing, but just checking mm. uh, what would be my reaction about it, no? And then I, I immediately said, oh, yeah, yeah, like, that's really interesting. I can't remember exactly the words of what I replied to it, because at the moment it was insignificant to me. And this is the thing that nothing with teenagers is insignificant. Nothing yeah. they say. Yeah. It's just for the sake of saying it, even if it sounds really silly. But yeah. we as teachers, nah, nah, we don't pay attention. Two or three days later, she came to me and she's like, I need you to tell me something. And I was like, what? Am I gay? <laughs> you want me to tell you? Like, I have no idea, right? Like, yeah. okay, let's explore it. Let's, <laughs> let's make you find out whether you are gay or not. But I, I can't tell you that. No, but if I tell you what have I done, maybe you can tell me. No, <laughs> no. Still, I can't tell you, even if you tell me what you've done. But that's the thing. The, and she was testing. Now I know that that comment before was checking whether I was a person that she could talk to or not. Yeah. And spent probably, yeah, three years talking about it. And yeah, it's still wow. something that, 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 yeah, was important. So definitely very good. Mm. And I, you know, I know that schools, you know, we throw around this phrase all the time of being data driven. Um, and I kind of think what an interesting data point to collect from your students. How many members, how many of your teachers do you feel confident and comfortable going to with an issue that would be personal? Or how many teachers do you feel like you could have a really hard conversation mm. with? Um, that would be great. That would be really interesting to find out. Absolutely. And you know what, Trisha, I think that, I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm going to be very bold here, but I think middle school teachers, I'm sorry, are a little bit better at that than high school teachers. I'm a high school teacher, and I think that high school teachers, we tend to be very like the content, the curriculum, the expertise yeah. of life, right? Like we kind of like lose a little bit of that. And mm -hmm. high school years are so important and you want to have these people and you want to have them in a school. You want to have those teachers creating the space for, for students to come and talk about these things because otherwise, who are they talking to about these things? An account on yeah. Instagram. Yeah, I know. I and know. that's and like, that's I, like I, I love that. I, I love that, that you brought that up because here are kids who are willing to have hard conversations with somebody who they do, have never met in person, but it's an Instagram and these are public. These are questions kids are willing to put public. Yeah. You know, and I just find that that's so fascinating. That's how they are. Yeah, it's so true. It oh, is and so I think, true. you know, we also forget that when we work in schools, we have, you know, I like that you pointed out that you think, you know, you've had middle school colleagues that do this really well. I think we forget sometimes actually we can rehearse conversations with one another. You know, yes. I think, um, you know, like the, the three of us are all married to somebody in education. And so we kind of have that built into our personal life. But, you know, my wife is a primary school teacher and, you know, like they, the kinds of hard conversations that they have actually are surprising, but also, you know, some of the stories, it's like, you know, a student peed his pants in class and had to go and, and talk to his teacher about that. And that's super hard. And so even yeah. just listening to my wife talk, yes. to like, how she handled that. There's a lot mm. of learning in that, but I, you know, I think it's important if you feel uncomfortable about discussing race, find that person on your campus um, who you know, has, has practiced that and just rehearse it. I think there's so much power in saying, you know, would you talk about this with me for 10 minutes? Because once you've done it one or two times, you can develop that confidence. It's always the first time where you feel like, I, I don't know how it's gonna go, you know? Um, yes, so that's a very good point. That's great, great advice. I definitely recommend that because it's about practice. You start feeling comfortable about it the more you talk about it. And that, that's what we want, right? We want them not to be afraid of talking about it, but we want us not to be afraid about talking about it. So rehearsing it is essential. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and I'm, I'm wondering too, you know, have you been in that position where you've just admitted to your students, like, I'm uncomfortable right now talking about this? Or, you know, this is difficult. This is tricky for me. Well... To be honest, 
I can't remember anything right now. I, I mean, and it's not like, oh, I'm very good at like, <laughs> any topic, throw it at me. I can handle it. No, but I, I think I haven't been in a position where the topic is, 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 is too sensitive. I had one student sharing one day, actually, now that you think about it. Yes, yes, there was a moment and I immediately uh, just took him downstairs to the, to the principal, like to the, to the high school office. Because and, and, and the topic wasn't necessarily that uncomfortable. It was just that uh, there was a problem with a helper in his house that had attacked his mother with a hammer, mm. like in the morning, and he had just seen it. So he came to tell me this, and he was just like, N- "I don't know what I can what say do or this, do yeah. for because this issue is, is is just bigger than than anything I could provide you with, right?" Mm-hmm. So if you allow me, can we go downstairs and t- go to the high school office and take this to someone who's definitely more prepared to deal with it. And I really appreciate that you came to talk to me about this mm-hmm. issue. But I think that will give you better support. And he was like, yeah, of course, thank you so much. And we went downstairs and that was it. Because this is also very important. We have to be very humble about it. Sometimes, I mean, as, as you said, we think like, oh yeah, I can handle this easily. Mm-hmm. No, like uh, if someone, for example, comes to talk to me about race, I really don't think prepare enough in the sets of tools, understanding content. I am right now educating myself about it, right? So to provide that, I definitely want to create the discussion, but I would not feel like I'm someone who can give you a good amount of support when it comes to that because I need the support as well. Right. So, and I think the other thing is too, is like being able to admit that, Yes. you know, I think kids, again, I want to use one of the comments I love that you made is that oftentimes, you know, especially teenagers, when you, they, they, they know, we all know this, they know when they feel like they're being talked down to and we're not treating them like adults, which is what you were saying. Right. And when you, when you try to fumble your way through a conversation rather than straight up and say, I'm educating myself right now on race as well. This is something we can all dig into together because I'm right there with you. Yes. I think is way, way more mature than trying to say, well, I know everything there is to know on race and you know, I can have it. And I think that's a, I just, I really like that, you know, and again, it's just being able to admit that we all have our shortcomings and our own knowledge and whatever our upbringings were and whatever that is, right? Yes, 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 absolutely. No, you're, you're definitely right. I'm very glad that you mentioned that because I think that's one, that's something I would like to add to the presentation and make it really clear because definitely is something that we need, we need to do. Just be very honest and very humble when it comes to these things because it can end up badly, right? Yes, absolutely. I just keep thinking about one of the hard conversations my wife had. And it was like, she was, I think she was a school counselor for, I think she was like in her third year of school counseling. And um, we were teaching in Saudi Arabia and she had a, a student come to her and actually say like, I don't know if I actually believe in Islam. And wow. it's like, like you live in, like you, in Saudi Arabia, you can't say that out loud. You know, and my wife is sitting there going like, uh, (laughs) like, how do I help you and support you without, you know, putting my values on something that, you know, in this country, if you said that out loud and the wrong person heard you could lead to death. And so it was really fascinating to be able to, and I mean, my wife's a pro at this. She's a counselor, you know, this is what she does. It's um, amazing to watch her go through these hard conversations. Um, but to be able to have those conversations and be able to just support kids without putting a value on feelings, right? Being able to just support you and make them and help them think through it, uh, get them the support they need, you know? Um, yeah, I just- Yes, 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 so yes, yes, absolutely. It's, 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 you need to understand that it's not easy, but you need to understand that you have to do it and you need to understand the consequences of how you do it. And the consequences and, of not doing it. And which are probably worst. Maybe, yeah. well, <laughs> but, but yeah, sometimes for sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
Well, thank you so much for your time and your energy. Uh, I just love it. It's, it's so good, right? Like this is what two, Trisha, is this two conversations in a row about hard conversations, you know, that, <laughs> that we've had two webinars and I just love it. Right. Because they're things, we need them. You know, we well, need them. we need them and we need to be reminded about them. And I mean, this is at the, at the end of the day, this is what teaching's about. You know, yes. this is, it's, it's about raising kids. It's about supporting children. It's about, you know, being there for them when they need you. That's, that's why you become an educator. You know, yeah. the content is going to come and go. Your curriculum is going to change every three years, whether you want it to or not, but the kids keep coming. And, and they you know, even people. if people, even if that's not why you became an educator, you know, neuroscience tells us if students don't feel safe, they're not primed to learning. Learn. They can't. So, you know, I, and I feel like we experience that as adult learners too, right? Like if you're in a team where you don't have that psychological safeness, safe, uh, safety, and you, you know, you're worried if I say something, somebody going to be angry, it really affects the team. And the same is, is yeah. true for, for our students. Um, and so I do think it's one of those things that it's a part of the job. It's like the, the worst kept secret, right? We all know it's part of the job, but where is it? being taught to us it certainly wasn't a part of like my teacher training <laughs> no, not mine. Yeah, right so true um and the yeah. thing is we we don't know how to do it because nobody did it with us when we were growing up so if we don't do it with them they're just gonna grow up to also be incapable of doing it to other people later so we just have to break that we just yeah. have to break that avoidance we are a society that loves to avoid things mm, very true and it just has to stop yeah Thank you so much, Guy, for having Thank you. Me. Thank you so much. I so appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Thank you for, uh, well, I'd say get up early, but you've been up since five <laughs> with the baby. So yeah, you get to go have lunch and take a nap. Now it's like nine. <laughs> That's great. No, so, thank, thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. And I hope my baby brain wasn't too blah, blah, blah. No, you're <laughs> fantastic. No, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Have a lovely day, everyone. Thank you for joining. Bye. Thank you.